Good evening. 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 Like I always say, that was weak. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> and welcome to UDC Recital Hall and our jazz forum for this evening. And my name is Willard Jenkins. And the subject of this evening's conversation with these distinguished writers is this book. And it's called Ain't but a few of us. Uh, a little bit on that curious title. <laughs> I once encountered, uh, was an eavesdropping, I guess you could say, on a conversation between two jazz greats, two NEA jazz masters, Milt Jackson and Jimmy Heath. And they were greeting each other in the lobby of a performance at Lincoln Center. And Bill Jackson said, you know, Jimmy, it really ain't but a few of us. And what Milt was talking about was that between the two of them and the remaining uh, survivors, there really ain't but a few of us left from their particular era known as the bebop era. But that, that name stuck with me. And down through the years, uh, I had an opportunity in my, particularly as I was developing my, my writing and that craft, I had an opportunity to go to, to visit festivals and uh, in somewhat far-flung places at times. And it was always interesting to me because the festivals uh, had, have a tendency sometimes to seat journalists in an area together. So I would encounter these names that I read in bylines and magazines and whatnot, the Leonard Feathers and Martin Williams and uh, Dan Morgensterns of the world. And, uh, they were all very collegial. And uh, you know, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was always good to, 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 to dialogue with them. But it became clear after a while that, hmm, I'm the only black writer here. Where are the other black writers? And when you consider the origins of this music as a, a distinctive product of the African experience in America, in large part, it's, it's even more curious. And when you consider the fact that so many of the great innovators uh, were black men and women, uh, it's even more curious about the somewhat, in the aggregate sense, scarcity of black jazz writers in particular and black music writers in general because the more I started interviewing people the more I recognized that this is kind of across the board in terms of, of music in terms of those who write about the music in terms of those who are who, who, who achieve uh, journalistic positions and those who are referred to as critics. I never referred to myself as a critic. It seemed a bit high-minded and whatnot. The whole aspect of being a critic. Plus, you know, I kind of thought to myself, well, I don't really have the, I don't think I have the grounding in the science, I use that in quotes, the science of music to be considered a critic. Because I would read people who were considered critics and they would talk about chord structures and those kinds of things. Not that that was what the average reader was interested in reading, mind you, but there was always a sense of, yes, I know about these chord structures. So th that's how you felt when you read some of those things. But long story short, in 2010, I started a series of interviews with black jazz writers. In, gen in particular, in black music writers in general, because I found that the more that I interviewed these writers, the more I discovered that they didn't always particularly specialize in jazz. They branched out and wrote about other musics as well as part of their music writing portfolio. And uh, so did these interviews, which started in an online series in 2010. And at a certain point, it became clear that, hmm, maybe there's a book here. 
And so, you know, put them all together in a book, and here we have Ain't But a Few of Us. And uh, we have four stellar contributors to this dialogue with us this evening. And uh, we'll start with our senior most member. Uh, to my far west, appropriately enough, is Holly West. <laughs> And Holly West appears in the section of the book. The book is sectioned off into various categories. And Holly West appears in the section of the book on newspaper writers and columnists. Uh, some of you may have been introduced to Holly West's jazz writing by way of his writings for the Washington Post. Additionally, his career included contributions on jazz for the Oakland Tribune, several Associated Press Bureau affiliations, including for the San Francisco and Sacramento bureaus of the AP, as well as the Harlem Bureau of the AP. Uh, Holly West also wrote about jazz for the New York Daily News and the Detroit Free Press. Holly West. <laughs> Sitting next to Holly, gentleman in distinguished looking hat and whatnot, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hat fan myself, so I had to notice that. <laughs> right. Is Don Palmer. And Don's chapter in the book <coughs> appears in the magazine Freelancers section. Don is a music and music arts and culture writer for numerous publications, including The Village Voice, The New York Times, Musician, and Downbeat magazines, among other publications. And uh, it's also very distinctive that, like me, Don had a career in arts administration. And I know that that career had somewhat colored his writing as well. But Don is a retired New York State Council on the Arts program officer. And he has served as a panelist and consultant for the Maryland State Arts Council. Seated next to me, is John Murph. And John Murph's contributions to Ain't But A Few of Us appears in the magazine freelancers section as well. Uh, Murph has contributed on jazz to the Washington Post, NPR, The Root, Atlantic Monthly, AARP, The Washington City Paper, The Washington Blade, Jazz Times, Downbeat, Jazz Wise, and Vibe Magazine. And John Murph is a former staffer of the National Jazz Service Organization. On the end is Steve Monroe. Steve's contribution to Ain't But a Few of Us appears in the opening round table. Uh, Steve is a jazz journalist and writer who initially covered music as a featured staff writer for the, Wa for the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. After re relocating to his hometown, Washington, D.C., Steve continued to cover jazz for many publications, including the Capital Spotlight, Metropolitan Afro-American, Eagle News, Capital Community News, and others. In 2004, he began writing a monthly jazz column for Capital Community News and for Jazz Avenues. I'd like to start by asking each of you this question. And I'll repeat it when your time comes. And we'll start with Holly. Uh, what factors initially inspired your interest in jazz? I think initially my interest in jazz was sparked by my interest in music. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, and music was in the air there. Uh, I could. Uh, walk up and down the street uh, when I was delivering papers, a uh, bicycle up and down sidewalks, and I heard people practicing their instruments, piano or other instruments. Uh, louder, Susan? Oh, cool. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I remember when I was about 12 years old, I stopped at the at the, the home of William Brown, William Brown, and his daughter 
soldier was practicing trumpet. She was practicing old folks at home. She was double tonguing, triple tonguing. And I was just starting uh, to learn trumpet. I was in the seventh grade. And so I uh, interrupted my paper delivering just so I could ask Trojan some questions. But the, uh, it was, uh, the music was all around us there. And so I, I, uh, my interest was stirred by that in part. And as in the, you, your interview with me, when my sister left for college in 1943, and I turned six, I was about to, 1943 really, and I was about to, I was six and I was about to turn, uh, enter the first grade, she was entering college, she left all of her records. And so I had access to those records. Goldman Hawkins, William Herman, uh, uh, Cal Basie, uh, the Mills Brothers, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, on Decca, uh, Bessie Smith on Columbia. So I, music just came to me naturally, and I jumped at the chance when I had, had the opportunity to start playing trumpet in the seventh grade. So Don, what factors initially inspired your interest in jazz? Well, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. My father said my first concert I went to and was to see the this month. Detroit Jazz Festival. I have no recollection of that. But I also took piano lessons. My parents wanted me to be a very cultured young Negro in 1960, when I remember it was from Ms. Maybelle Sheely, who used to work with our Tatum back in the day in Toledo. She also was County College teacher. I could say Stanley just stole my talent. Uh, and then also my school was unusual in that we had a music instructor, Dr. Carroll, like in second grade. He made us memorize all the birthdays of the composers and what they wrote, all classical, but it's still in music. Uh, and we also sang the French National Anthem to the Symphony Orchestra when I was in second or third grade in French. We used to speak French in Toledo, Ohio back then, but that was one of the things my school did. And also my parents and their desire to, to show that they moved from the South to, to Toledo, Ohio, took me to the opera. I saw nine operas before I was nine years old. So it's just, you know, that my father was a failed clarinetist with uh, Morgan State, but he became an optometrist, so he gave up that. Dream of being a jazz musician, to be a father and husband, and I'm, I'm the only kid. But he had he had Shape of Jazz to Come, Change of the Century, um, some monk records, so he had these unusual records, so um, he even had, a, I believe it was um, Free Jazz, that Barnett Coleman record, so I had those things in my house. He didn't listen to them anymore because he was being an eye doctor, but they were there, so. I early on stumbled upon these things, and he also told me that I like Snoopy and the Red Baron and the Monkeys and the Clovers and, you know, Love Potion Number 9. I just do some real music, like jazz. <laughs> so, you know, I had to follow his, his lead. And the other thing is they they bought me, I don't know, most of you, I think, almost remember the Disney records, that they had 12 records, like Fantasia, that, so we owned all of those, so they got played in my house. So it's just, there was just music around, and I guess I gravitated toward it even though I was a terrible musician. <laughs> so John Murph, as a person who came up in Mississippi, mm -hmm. what factors initially inspired your interest in jazz music? Well, growing up, it was very musical. Um, when I grew up in the 70s. Um, I can't say I grew up in a jazz per se household. It was a musical household in which jazz wasn't separated from other forms of black music. So I grew up listening to Ramsey Lewis next to Fifth Dimension, next to Jackson Fire, next to Urban Fire. Um, and I think that was a, that's very healthy. Uh, by that I mean um, jazz wasn't presented as vegetables, you know, if you're if you gravitated toward it, you know, it was there for you. Um, early on, I noticed I was gravitating towards instrumental music. I can't say it was jazz. I think it was maybe jazz influence. You know, I'm talking about the soundtrack to Shaft or the instrumental music that War or Mandrell or Santana, uh, all those people 
But what was interesting is a lot of those bands did have a certain jazz knowledge. And as I got older, I would just kind of um, connect with the dots. So I would see a Carl Santana record there, it's Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter. Eventually, you know, seeing Wayne Shorter on the Weather Report records. And again, you know, Weather Report, you know, this. 70s black music, this is cookout music. It wasn't like Carnegie Hall. It's like, this is what you played during the cookout. <coughs> Eventually, following his name from there to now status to whatever. So it was, it was very organic. You know, I didn't have a teacher say, okay, today we're going to listen to, to jazz. You know, we heard the Crusaders, you know, all the kind of bluesy, John Guitar Watson. It was a very natural way, so I never, I have never separated jazz music from the whole social musical experience of Black America. Steve, how, how, what factors initially inspired your interest in jazz? I would say family. My mom was uh, a big, uh, big fan of, of people like Dinah, um, Dakota Staten. Ella and Sarah, um, but also Brooke Benton, Nat King Cole. And so those were the kinds of things that I listened to coming up in the 50s. And, um, and then in the early 60s, um, actually I did take, I took clarinet, and I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that. I'm trying to remember why I took clarinet. I think I took clarinet for a couple of years because of seeing Benny Goodman on TV. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of jazz, jazz per se on TV, but for some reason that struck me, and I did take clarinet for a while. Um, and then also in the early 60s, another influence were friends of, friends of the family, friend of my dad's, was a big Shirley Scott fan, introduced me to her. And then from there, another friend, a friend of my mom's, introduced me to uh, Wes Montgomery and Jimmy Smith, and I played the Wes Montgomery and Jimmy Smith records for forever and ever. So I would say it was definitely um, the family influence that, that got me grounded in jazz. Um, you know, like, like John, I obviously enjoyed all the music, the Motown and uh, Stevie Wonder and, and all of that um, at the time. But for some reason, jazz struck a chord. And when I started to get interested in writing, that was uh, the music that I started writing about. Well, you know, I guess I guess that, that leads me as a perfect lead into my next question for all of you, and that is, uh, how and when did you become interested in writing about jazz, and what were some of your first experiences writing about jazz? Well, my my first uh, uh, experience of writing about jazz took place in college. Uh, I didn't do any of that sort of thing in high school. I did write for the local newspaper, but I wrote about sports because uh, I, I feel like the old geezer up here. <laughs> when these guys are talking about LPs, the first records I listened to were 78s. <laughs> Not even 45s were available. <laughs> Those are the records that we were listening to uh, when I was a youngster. Uh, but uh, and, and, and in high school, I started writing about sports because the local paper did not cover the uh, football and basketball uh, games of our arts school. Uh, I went to a segregated, racially segregated high school, Douglas High School in Wewoka, Oklahoma. And the tendency there was to have a student, uh, have a teacher recruit a student to write the game stories. So in my junior and senior years, I wrote game stories. I was intensely interested in sports. I, I, I subscribed to several sports magazines. I read the sports pages of several newspapers. So I uh, emulated the writing of all the sports writers I read. Uh, so I, and 
I went through a period where I was interested in sports that I uh, evolved into jazz. I started, my sub first subscription to Downbeat was in 1950. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I read people like Leonard Feather and, uh, uh, and George Barkla and uh, other people who, who preceded, uh, even Nat Hintoff was not even writing for Tom Beat at the time. <laughs> uh, and Martin Williams was not at the time. Uh, so I started uh, writing about jazz in college at Ohio State. Uh, and I, I inherited a record column called Discourses. Uh, that was a regular feature of the student daily. And I, I wrote for that in my junior and senior years. That, that started my interest in regular chance. Well, Don, from listening to the music and your father's records and whatnot, how did you make the transition to writing about the music? And what were some of your first experiences? I can't really recall when I first wrote about music, per se. But Maumee Valley Country Day School was a special school, you know, and you had to write, you had vocabulary quizzes, and uh, you had 20 page term papers you had to do. So who knows what, or what I wrote about. We had a guy who thought, of, who thought, of, he thought of himself as a jazz, as a sort of a jazz musician, and he was much good at all, but he, but he would give lectures on jazz and put diversions and talk about all kinds of nonsense. He was, he was entertaining, but he really shouldn't have been teaching kids. <laughs> I'm concerned, but but we had to write. So um, I was I wanted to be probably the young black Jack Kerouac. So the stream of conscious writing. So if you're reading that, you're going to be listening to something about jazz in some ways, the poetry of that and that. Um, and in college, I had a radio show, jazz and blues, whatever. I'm on college, so I'm not sure what made me well, start writing things in school paper there, but my my jazz professor was Stanley Crouch, so that would inspire you to want to write, or he may inspire you to want to run screaming from the room, depending on <laughs> what day it is. Um, so, and then I, so it's hard for me to say, I, I know, I remember specifically my first article I wrote was on Wardell Gray, but not on Wardell Gray, but because of Wardell Gray in Madison, Wisconsin, because the guy who wrote about it, the, the most prestige releases, wanted to know why we hadn't heard more from him. I thought, well, the broken neck of the Las Vegas would have something to do with that. And I explained to him that you need to read the liner notes of the obituaries before you ask those questions. And he said I should write the, I should write the column instead for him. So I did that. And I was the head of the jazz station, a jazz show, a drive time show, a blues show, a late night show. So I so I was on the radio a lot. So there was and, and in Madison I started writing a lot more. And I moved to New York and I to become a famous jazz journalist because it's a paucity of jazz being written must meet new writers and young black writers. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> that was not the case. So that's, that's really, it was, it's, it's because I went to a school where you had to write. So therefore you, and being at that point, you become sort of a social historian, cultural historian, and like the Gramscian um, Marxist historian, maybe you write about social, the relation between social, society, culture, and economics. So, so it kind of started at the University of Wisconsin. It started at Pomona College. It started before, and it started probably. It started probably in high school because we did have a anti-war uh, socialist uh, history professor, <laughs> and we also had a Latin teacher who took us to Rome, and he decided that there was no point in learning Latin, so we, we took. We started Greek, and everyone thought Greek is really hard. So, but we so we still studied uh, in, um, word derivation. So, it, it improved the vocabulary. So, you gotta have something to write about that's intellectual to use those big words no one knows the meaning of. So that was that's probably the start. It was just interested, interesting culture. We went to museums, we went to plays. That was that was sort of my upbringing um, junior high school, high school. Well, Murph, when you first arrived at the National Jazz Service Organization. You, you explicitly said, one of the things I want to do is to write about jazz. So when did you go from being an enthusiast of music to actually writing about 
My first writing gig was at Mississippi State University for the school newspaper. It was called The Reflector. And uh, I had a moment of truth when I switched my major from accounting to journalism. Uh, and I started writing uh, record reviews. It was my first paid gig. Uh, and one of the reasons I chose jazz was because it was to fill a need. Uh, there was um, one, a friend of mine who was really into Kate Bush and um, Tom Waits and The Cure. He encouraged me to uh, write. And there was another guy who was already writing. That's when Anita Baker and Chardet was there. And so they didn't need anyone else to cover r and let's say. Well, I can do jazz. I was buying the records now. Granted, I didn't have the knowledge of uh, uh, London Feather or Nat Hentoff. I, you know, I didn't have that schooling, that backing. But because the way I grew up, I grew up in books, I knew what good writing was. I didn't know what good journalism, I mean, jazz journalism was, but I knew good writing. And so. Uh, that, was a, that was a start, and at Mississippi State, it also gave me a chance to interview my first uh, jazz musician, Ramsey Lewis, which was very special for me because I grew up listening to his music and, you know, just being able to um, interact with someone who was a hero, and eventually my writing enabled me to get two consecutive internships at the Smithsonian, and that's how I ended up coming to Washington, D.C., uh, through the American History Museum working on the Duke Ellington collection. So it was a gradual, and I still think my writing is gradual. You know, I'm still trying to you know, write like my um, mentors. Well, Steve, at what point did uh, writing about the music uh, become a passion or pursuit of yours uh, after initially developing your interest in music? Right. Well, I, um, yeah, it was early high school when I really became fascinated with jazz, but then uh, didn't really write about it until my first, uh, my first newspaper job. I actually started in sports um, in Rochester, covered everything from um, high school football, girls tennis, to eventually covering um, the NBA and um, the NFL. And I did that for a few years and wanted to branch out. I wanted to, to get into feature writing and um, covered a, a lot of different kinds of features, um, covered some plays, and I noticed that no one was covering jazz. Oh, I, I covered a lot of R&D, uh, Confunction, if anybody remembers them, a yeah. whole bunch of uh, groups back in those days. Um, but no one was covering the jazz groups that were coming through town, and there were a lot of people coming through Rochester and Buffalo at that time. And I think the very first uh, person I covered was Phil Woods, the alto saxophonist. And I, I, I jumped to cover him because I was going crazy about Charlie Parker in those days. And, discovered him in the 60s and um, discovered Phil Woods and he had a lot of Charlie Parker stories to tell obviously becoming an alto saxophonist and that's how that started and soon after that started going to Buffalo covering people like uh, Abdul Ibrahim or Dollar Brand as he was mostly called in those days. Um, Earl Father Hines came through um, very educational about uh, jazz from the 20s and 30s. So it was, um, like John said, it was to fill a need because no one else was really doing it. And that sort of sparked me to um, uh, cover all these people. Well, you know, it's interesting that, that, that each of you seem to have a common thread of having begun to write about the music as students. Uh, Holly, at what point or points in your efforts at writing about jazz did you get a sense that there were so few black writers 
covering jazz, and what was your initial sense of that disparity? Well, I knew that from the very beginning. Certainly, I knew that in college, uh, uh, as as I began to uh, read more analytically. Uh, I, I I think I mentioned to you in the book interview. Uh, I was taken with Alan Morrison's piece on Bud Powell in Ebony Magazine, but uh, that was not for the general press. Uh, and I, uh, I saw that that was happening, but I also recognized that there were few black journalists writing for general publications. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I was out uh, to try to change some of that. Uh, there were a handful of us in the School of Journalism at Ohio State. Uh, one uh, longtime friend is Paul Delaney, who was uh, a couple years ahead of me, and also he'd been in the military. Paul went on to work at the Washington Star and the New York Times, and is still living. Uh, and there were uh, several others. I don't know if they made any marks in newspaper journalism, but I, I, I felt that uh, uh, times were changing, and uh, I, had, I was under the influence of my stepfather, uh, Hugh Simpson Tate, who influenced me to go into journalism. He was the Southwest Regional Council for the NAACP. He saw that things were changing. He wanted me to major in radio, TV journalism, but I didn't have any interest in that. I wanted to uh, concentrate in print journalism. But you know, uh, it was that influence as well uh, that caused me to want to branch into areas that where blacks had not excelled. So, Don, at what point did you uh, come to the realization that you were among a few? Well, I can say that it wasn't just about jazz. I can say that basically, mm -hmm. pretty obvious that there were very few black writers writing seriously about music, regardless of what it was. They were writing more about what's the top 10, what's the top 50. They were writing about consumerism in music, which is a valid thing in a capitalist consumer society. But they weren't really analyzing music or the social function. All they were talking about sales, essentially. I grew up listening to Motown, which maybe probably like to listen to more jazz, but I got tired of Motown because it was you heard it every day in Cleveland, Ohio, all day long. But but it was just you know you, it's you go into a room and you see there are very few non-white men uh, talking or writing about music. And one as a as a kid, I was a lot more interested in blues or, or you know as a teenager in blues, and there were no black writers writing about blues because basically the urban elite had little interest in that slave slavery time music. So it was so the people who revived it were white folklorists. Um, so um, I was interested in doing that from, from a perspective different than being the outside observer. But I, you know, it, I always kind of knew it and, and it probably helped that I was the, in 1960 I guess it was, in the parliament today, the first Negro to go to this country day school. So I was, I was raised always being the only, you know, so it was always very obvious to me, you know, you have to just figure out how to be comfortable with it because, you know, and, and sometimes being the only was good because you were prized and petted. Other times it was really annoying because you were petted. But, um, but you know, so it was just, it, it was, to me, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, I got too, so the, we had the Bronze Raven, which is Billy Brower's father's paper, my mother worked for him. But, you know, it was, it was the, the uh, the, uh, the the free papers and things in Chicago and Detroit, you know, they were they were good papers and interesting. The Berkeley Bar I used to get, but you know, there weren't. You could see there they were there there were alternative papers, um, but people who had time on their hand didn't even make any money. Um, and that meant generally white men back then. Well, Murph, when did when did it dawn on you that you were one of only a few? or a handful of black jazz writers, in particular music writers in general. I think I said this before, in 
um, it was late because I came from Mississippi to DC and as a black person, DC can spoil you. Uh, you know, my entry to DC was through the Smithsonian. You know, Fitzroy Thomas and Ruben Jackson was there. From there, you know, I worked with you, I met you, I met Susan, you know, and I was at um, WPFW, Katistit, taught me how to be on the board, and so um, I had, you know, Eugene Holly, I had access to Greg Tate, um, and that's the beauty of that, you know, there was, there was a, I was trying to figure out how to say this. You know, black excellence in D.C. is normalized. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have this, I'm the only. I thought, you know, this is what we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it started to dawn on me when I was maybe at the city paper. And even still, it was delayed because Ruben had written for the city paper. Bobby Ed had written for the city paper. I just, again, that's, hey. <laughs> no, there was so much of the hard, harder work was already paid for me as a black journalist in DC. It dawned on me when I started working at NPR and uh, going to international festivals. I was like, oh, oh, this is a, I think I was fully grown until I realized I was like this unicorn thing. Yeah, in DC, you know. There's so many black people that was doing it, you know, on a high level with agency. So it was delayed. Well, Steve, what about you? When did it dawn on you that 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 you were amongst a few? It was in it was in Rochester when I first started covering jazz, but of course at that time when I was looking around, and not just the jazz, but just music in general, not many, if hardly any, black writers. I may have been the only one. Um, and at the time, for those few years, those years in Rochester, I sort of passed it off. I said, well, this is Rochester. It's just a, a mid-major town. I'm sure there's plenty in New York and D.C. and elsewhere. But then when I got did get to D.C. in the late 70s, early 80s, there were not as many as I thought. Um, and so it, it did strike me as very interesting that um, all of the music that I covered and the R&B and the soul and, and the jazz in particular, um, African-American art form, that there were not that many, surely not as many as I thought there would be, especially even on the East Coast. Well, Holly, as you develop your jazz writing, and your journalism and criticism craft, were there any specific encounters or obstacles, real or perceived, that you felt were racially motivated? Uh, I can't think of any. I, uh, I had a pretty smooth ride. Uh, now, I didn't write about jazz for the Oakland Tribune or the Associated Press. I started writing about jazz uh, at the Post, the Washington Post. Uh, and I was not hired to write about jazz. That was something that I brought up after I was hired. I was hired to do uh, work for the uh, Metro Dance eventually to cover what was then called the District Building, now called the John Wilson Building. And I covered the City Council. But I volunteered to write about jazz uh, just to do features for the old entertainment section. And they welcomed that because there was no one doing it. And I saw an opportunity and I jumped at it. Uh, in, 19, in January of 1969, when the style session uh, began, uh, I was selected as one of the charter members of the style section, uh, not just to cover jazz, but to look at social trends. 
to write feature pieces about what was going on in American life. Uh, jazz was not primary. Uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, it was a wonderful time in journalism and newspapering. My old friend Earl Caldwell, who uh, uh, st started jur in journalism in 1960, said that he and I, when we landed in New York in 1965, he with the Herald Tribune and I with the Associated Press, that we saw the last of the golden age of journalism because newspapers were spending money to, to send reporters out on assignments. Uh, mm. and I, uh, with the South section, uh, when that began, uh, it was the first of its kind. Uh, uh, money seemed to be no object in sending people out on assignment. When I interviewed Dave Brubeck, he, he could not see me uh, at his home in Groton in Connecticut. He was going out to uh, uh, Cincinnati to supervise the uh, performance of an oratorio he had written. We met at Kennedy Airport, took a plane out to uh, Cincinnati. I interviewed him on the plane. He took a car into Cincinnati. I took a plane back to Washington. <laughs> That's the, the way money was spent in those days. <laughs> and just as, uh, as an appendage, when I interviewed Duke Ellington, I went out to Indianapolis and spent three days there at the hotel uh, with him where the band was performing. <laughs> and the Post went along with all of that. Those days don't exist in You know, mentioning Washington, you know, hearing you talk about life at the Washington Post and starting a, 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 a being there at the ground floor of the development of the style section. I was reminded of, uh, I don't know if you've read Jill Nelson's book, Volunteer Slavery. Oh, yes, I know it. Because well, she, 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 she mentions you very favorably in that book. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, she's, she's, <laughs> but she came along after I had left the post. Right, so she exactly. had a, a, a little different experience there. But uh, yeah, I knew Jill. <laughs> uh, Don, how about you? You know, what, you know, as you were developing the craft, did you have instances or or when you you felt that were somewhat racially motivated? Well, um, probably a few times, but I was a, first of all, because my parents were ugly, we paid for you to go to college and I get a job, if, you know, being a freelance writer and you can't pay your rent, wasn't their idea of what they paid for. So, so I pretty much, I, don't, I always had a job. My dad was also the, I had a doctor, was like, you should have a job for health care and join a union. So, so I was, I wasn't always the most cooperative freelance writer because I was very picky. I wouldn't write about. I wouldn't write about what I wanted to write about. And probably for a long time, I would really write write about a white band position, um, just just because it was just you know a choice I would make. But I didn't have to. Uh, but my only, what it would occasionally happen in freelance assignments, someone would contact me and say they were doing this assignment or something, whatever it is, and I having advice for them and stuff and said. Why aren't I writing? Why are you calling me, the brother, to find out more about whatever it is? And they'd be like, well, we suggested that. I suggested that the other, but that's, you know, that was an editorial decision. Could have been a better writer, whatever it is. He looked like the boss, I don't know. But so I, that didn't always bother me very much. The one, the only one real instance was in an interview I was at the New York Times where I was being interviewed for the culture desk. And I had been warned by, by a Hispanic American to watch out for the question that's going to come. Um, they said that you won't know who, you'd be surprised who might come from. And I was actually asked in an interview if I could write about white people. And at which point I thought, I'm not getting the job. And I thought, I should have asked Kurt, can you write about men? You ask white men, can you write about white, black people? But I literally was asked in the interview. Um, so. Um, can you? Not will you, but can you? Well, I pointed out that I used to go see, I, I used to go see Alice Cooper as a kid, you know, and Ted Nugent and the Young Boy Dukes, you know, and Jay, Jay Giles, and I love those bands. It's like, I know a lot about white music, but, and white culture, my youth. But I knew, I knew at that moment that I probably was not 
Yeah. No, I was not. <laughs> well, Murph, did you, at any points, did you have any experiences in terms of writing about music and in terms of various roadblocks, etc.? Did you have any experiences that you felt were racially motivated? You know, it's, sometimes it's hard to, to, you know, you don't want to always think things are racially motivated, and sometimes um, you have to be way up from that experience, you know. Um, I've been really lucky uh, for the most part. Uh, not only did I have, you know, grew up you know, being in D.C., you know, I had great white people vouch for me. You know, it was like Roll Stokes and Mike uh, Joyce. One of my best friend is Aaron Cohen. So, you know, I, I can't ignore their help and I can't ignore other non-black people who continue to, you know, help me achieve certain things. Um, there have been some occasions in which um, I've written and um, uh, there was a ratio of, you know, blackness, and this is for my, my some mainstream publications, like I remember. Um, Are you speaking of editorial license now? Editorial license, you know, like when you're, you know, I remember um, doing a piece about like women who rock, and I was like, hey, name all these women who um, made these first, and the editor made me change a bit, like four or five of these people. Hmm. Uh, we're talking about Regina Carter, Patrice Russian, Caroline Carrington. Uh, no, these first, you know, Caroline making being the first one to win the uh, Grammy for uh, Jazz Nationalists. Uh, Patrice Russian, who I think she was the first one to be the music director for the Grammys. Um, Regina Carter, first woman in African American playing with um, Paganini Batman. Well, we had to delete those. Um, and non black editor said, well, We don't know who these people are. <laughs> And you know, this is recent now. This one, you know, Google's been around for a minute. <laughs> but I was taken aback about how the lack of interest if that makes any sense. The lack of okay, I'm the lack of trust as a black writer. Okay, I'm not going to give you just anyone. I'm giving you these first these trailblazers. And as a journalist, I would think that your readers deserve to know who these people are, even if you don't know these people. That's what journalism is. But yeah, I've had those kind of instances where um, black people are erased and you have to sit there and you know go to happy hour and drink the blues away. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, how about you? Uh, did, did, did you have uh, experiences as a writer, uh, I guess you could call them bumps in the road, that you felt were racially motivated? Yes, I have to say in general, not from editors, I mostly had, had free reign to come up with ideas and pursue those ideas um, for um, jazz musicians or other musicians, other uh, music people. Um, so in, in general, just the general um, obstacles that we go through as as black people, as journalists. I remember trying to cover Kenny Morrell concert near Niagara Falls once, and um, I thought I had all my credentials online, but they were you know, scrutinizing my credentials and asking me, where are you from again? And who are you covering? And are you a writer? And uh, those kinds of things. But those kinds of things happen to all of us black journalists, sometimes journalists in general, um, uh, there was a time in upstate New York, I was covering Sarah Vaughn, who I've mentioned this the last 
um, Sarah Vaughan was uh, singing with the Philharmonic of Rochester, and it was a small, small town, smaller town, and it was my credentials that were questioned. But uh, those kind of things, unfortunately, you come to accept being black, growing up black. <laughs> um, but in general, editorially, I, I think I, I did pretty well in hindsight. Um, when I had to submit things to an editor for approval, I generally was pretty successful. I just add a little more to the things that John was saying. I think a lot of it is, is that you write something that's outside the experience of those editors, and then you have to justify it. And to justify it takes up too much space. You have to take it out of the article because you know I had an editor who didn't really understand my mother's pathological dislike of being sat by the kitchen. She, she, he couldn't understand why that would matter. I said, she sat in the back of the bus. It's just, you don't get it. Mm. But I thought it was nuts because it was annoying to me because I didn't care. But for her, that was a big deal. She stood right in the kitchen, she didn't walk out. Mm -hmm. But I had her who just couldn't, understand, couldn't comprehend that. Mm. I want to add, I want to give you this story. In 1971, uh, a group of guys, uh, the most prominent among or uh, Topper Guru, who was the founder of the New Art and Architecture Center here in Adams Morgan. I, some of you probably are familiar with that group. I know Rusty is. <laughs> uh, and Julian Ewell, who was then an assistant secretary at the Smithsonian's institution, uh, called for the resignation of Willis Collow. Willis at that time occupied several uh, highly placed positions in jazz. He was the, the jazz uh, director uh, at the Kennedy Center. Uh, he was uh, also uh, what, uh, had a similar position in the White House and another uh, in, a, in the federal government in addition to his Voice of America role. Uh, I wrote an extended piece about this, and then wrote a sidebar, also calling, and this is stating my opinion, calling for his resignation. Uh, my editors supported me fully. I even wrote a second opinion piece calling for his resignation. Uh, Dan Morgenstern then the editor of Downbeat wrote a column questioning my judgment. <laughs> uh, Paul Delaney wrote a piece for the New York Times just recounting what had transpired. Uh, and uh, in later years, I, I learned that there had been some exchange letters between uh, the White House, an advisor to Nixon uh, during the Nixon administration, Leonard Dorrance, had written letters to people at the Post questioning why such uh, opinions were allowed in the Post. And I'm not going to name any names, but people at the Post uh, one in particular said that we probably laid an egg. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but my editors in the South section supported me fully. Uh, so I, I, I could see no racial discrimination there at all. One of the things I always like to say in these forums as kind of a disclaimer is the fact that this is not a book of aggrieved writers. This is not a book full of grievances. Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole uh, idea behind this book is that these writers are expressing their journeys to achieve bylines and some of the things that they've achieved in their careers. And uh, along the way, there have been matters that suggest racial disparities in terms of their 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 development of their craft, and that is essentially the the theme of this book. Uh, 
And I also, I also have to add that as you sit here and look at a, at a, at a panel full of men, I also have to add that there are a number of women contributors to this book. In fact, we're having another panel discussion and forum on the book on Wednesday, March 15th at Sankofa Books and Video. And since it's Women's History Month, they specifically requested a panel of women contributors to this book, and that's what we'll have on Wednesday, March 15th. Uh, so please don't get the sense that this is a total male-dominated book <laughs> or that this pursuit of writing about jazz is totally male-dominated because there have been some women who have contributed mightily to this dialogue. Uh, I'll ask each of you uh, a closing question, and that would be, what is your overall sense of participating in this black jazz writer's dialogue? I'm happy to participate because it brings me uh, closer to what's going on today and what has happened in the past. I have not written for a daily newspaper since 1993. So uh, I've done contract writing since. Uh, so I have not had my hand in jazz writing at all, uh, ex except uh, for maybe some freelance pieces. And so I, I'm happy to, to rub shoulders with people who are still active and who have more recent experiences than I. Uh, and I I'm, I'm eager to absorb some of their wealth <laughs> well, Don, what's your, what, what's your sense of, of having participated in this Black Jazz Writers Dialogue? Ain't but a few of us. Um, fine by me, and I think that you know I'm on the Jazz Journal Association board, so I'm so I'm still involved in some ways. I, he said I am retired, and I pretty much feel like I've done my bit, and I don't I can enjoy doing other things in life. But I think the dialogue is important. I think if we look at what's taking place around us, the, the notion of it certain topics are, are off limits because those aren't relevant to the black experience or they make white people uncomfortable and things of that nature. But I think the, so the discussion needs to continue on because it's about the growth and expansion you know, the, of, of, of society and culture. So um, I think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, and um, I look forward to more such conversations because if people don't talk about things, I think it's resolved. You don't, you don't acknowledge the problem, you can't address the problem. And right now we seem to be in a backwards lighting moment of let's ignore the problems. You know, um. Murph, what's your sense of, of having participated in this ain't but a few of us dialogue? Not, 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 not this dialogue this evening, but just overall the whole book project. Well, it was an honor and a privilege. Um, you know, writing is already um, a solitary, you know, profession. You know, you out there in the community or you're um, reviewing a concert or you're interviewing someone, but the actual writing, you're kind of by yourself and you can live in your head. Um, and so the book is almost like, the, like a certain green book. Like, just learning uh, the different generation of black writers and editors and um, their histories and the similarities and the differences, you know, because no one was really, you know, you had one person over here and you had another person here, and sometimes you did, we didn't know each other, you know, sometimes you didn't, you didn't know this person was black based on the my line, and so it was quite illuminating, and it was comforting, you know. Uh, um, uh, it was a true honor, you know. Steve, how about you? Uh, I'll definitely echo that. It's an honor and a privilege to even be on the panel of Mr. West, for instance. Um, uh, and then, I guess, number one, the fact of the women contributors um, was completely educational for me. Um, I did run into, meet, at least uh, 
communicated with Bridget, one of the contributors, a couple of years ago, but up until then, I was not aware of women contributors. Um, so it was fascinating, the lady in Brooklyn and, and what she had been doing. Um, so it was extremely and she was in pure yes, 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 yes. That was that was extremely fascinating and educational for me. I would encourage everyone to read to read that. Um, uh, one other part in the book that was fascinating was I forget who did the chapter, but it was talking about the international um, the links between jazz or the music that we call jazz and the musics that are in. Uh, Scandinavia, Italy, Japan, and elsewhere. I thought that was a fascinating part. Um, the other part is that I think we all have um, realized something. We touched on this in the last forum. We need to do some education and mentorship to grow our youth, um, our black youth, to become jazz writers, critics, journalists, um, to help fill. There are a lot of gaps. There's a lot of music, and we need to get more of us involved. And you know, it's a, it, I, I, that, that's a very important point. I want to stress myself in that there are opportunities for us to mentor younger people and to uh, convey the recognition that this is a viable pursuit writing about jazz, in particular writing about music in general, is a viable pursuit and it's a way to, to uh, it's a pathway to other opportunities. Uh, and I know that, that that has been certainly been the case with, with, uh, with, with my work in that uh, I started out writing about the music and that got me into other opportunities and other situations and opened other doors. And so we have, uh, we have a situation now where I always liken the strongest part of the jazz community, the strongest arm of the jazz community is jazz education. Because like what happens here at UDC, we have jazz education programs all, all over the world. And all of the major conservatories, most of them, if not all of them, have embraced jazz now at this point. You know, you've got programs at schools like Juilliard and whatnot. And we see these young people who still have a great interest in the music and still have an interest in learning how to play this music, but then we also know but not all of them will become professional musicians. Only a small percentage of them will become professional musicians. So I think it's up to people like us to convey to them that this writing about the music is another opportunity, another pathway to keep that door open along your journey through this music we call jazz. And just real quick, um, the book is broken down into several sections. It begins with a round table. And then the second section is the authors. And that is uh, black writers who've written books about jazz and jazz subjects. The third section is black magazine, black jazz magazine editors and publishers. And that's important to note because as, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, a woman named Joanne Cheatham is one of the contributors to that section. And there are only, four contributors to that section. Uh, but there have indeed been uh, black jazz publications published, including Joanne Cheatham published a, 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 a glossy magazine called Pure Jazz, which is still, still published online. Uh, a gentleman named Jim Harrison, who was a jazz enthusiast, published the Jazz Spotlight News. Uh, another man named Hayward Houston out in, in, in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area published Jazz Now, and Ron Wilburn published the, the Grackle. And the Grackle was a publication that came along approximately the same time, or right behind, uh, he was known as Leroy Jones at the time, but Amiri Baraka's publication, The Cricket. <laughs> I had an experience 
Uh, one year of the Jazz Journal Association, I, I was honored to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Jazz Journalist Association. And the person who presented me with the award was Amelia Baraka, who had received the same award the year prior to that. And so, so in, his, in his opening remarks, he made sure that I knew about the cricket because this whole series was underway at that point. Uh, the fourth section of the book is Black Dispatch Contributors. That's important because we are talking about African-American newspaper, African-American newspapers, and there's been a great neglect, unfortunately, of jazz music and jazz reportage in African-American newspapers. And curiously enough, there are only two contributors to that particular section. Uh, the fifth section is magazine freelancers. And the sixth section is newspaper writers and columnists of which Holly West is one of only three. Uh, the seventh section is the new breed, and those are black writers who have come along since online publishing has been an entity. And then we close the book with an anthology. Uh, in doing the research for this book, I came across a number of fascinating uh, contributions by black jazz writers down through the years. Uh, in various publications, starting with uh, a piece that is kind of the core theme of this book. And that's a classic piece that uh, Leroy Jones, later known as Amiri Baraka, wrote called Jazz and the White Critic in Downbeat Magazine in 1963. And I should also mention that uh, that anthology includes a piece written by a woman named Barbara Gardner. Barbara Gardner was very important. Barbara Gardner is the, the only, and I'll repeat that, she is the only African-American writer who achieved an editorial position at a major jazz magazine. She was an associate editor of Downbeat Magazine in the late 50s and early 60s. And so we have a piece that she contributed to Downbeat. And she later went on to a very successful career at, in advertising. But uh, she is the only black jazz writer who, has, who achieved an editorial position at a major jazz publication. Do any of you have any questions? I'd like to open it up for any questions you might have. Yeah, how are you? Well, I remember that the whole issue with Willis Connell and Bruce Deagle <laughs> reverberated throughout the, the world, I'm sure. Hold on a second. Let's get this on the mic. Can I borrow the phone? What What made you leave the Washington Post? I'm sorry? What made you leave the Post? Why did you leave the Post? That's a very complicated story, Rusty, and I, I, I will only give you a couple of highlights. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, that's a complicated story, and I, I'll give you a few highlights. So some of it is recounted in Dr. Gilliam's memoir, though. You can get more detail there to push her memoir. But I, I uh, had a conflict with the editor of the style section. It was a personality conflict. Uh, uh, he wanted to get out of the style section. I was given the option uh, by higher editors to find a place in sports or leave the paper. And I chose to leave the paper. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, incidentally, uh, uh, one of the editors at that time told me that I had become too serious and intellectual. Wow. <laughs> because you, as you know, I wrote pieces, uh, long pieces about Ralph Ellison and John O. Franklin. <laughs> too serious and too intellectual. <laughs> and, 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 and about your experiences growing up in Oklahoma, and, and, and you know, that, that was also very insightful and important in your years. Uh, what about my experiences? About, about Oklahoma, coming from Oklahoma. You know, that connection with Ralph Ellis and the whole connection of black experience in Oklahoma. No, are, are you asking me to... No, no, I'm just saying that oh, yeah, that was part of 
being oh, very oh, intellectual. Oh, 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 oh yes, yes. Well, see, I, 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 I uh, Ellison's novel, uh, Invisible Man, was pushed on me in high school, and I, I, I refused Mrs. Garman's uh, 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 suggestion. And I didn't read it until I was in college, and I read it over and over then. And Ellison's book, Shadow and Act, had not been published at the time. Now, this was the, the mid-50s at Ohio State. So I went through the Reader's Guide in the main library just to find every magazine piece Ellison had written to track him down. So I, I, uh, and I finally got my chance to interview him uh, in 1973 for that uh, uh, three-part series of random books. Any other questions? Please, join, please. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I really know in order to be a good writer, you have to be a good reader as well, too. And all of you have established that. Could you talk about, you know, what you think, um, I guess, music programs in the public school curriculum or even in the college curriculum may be lacking this day in encouraging the kind of reading, reading that would add to jazz writing or any kind of writing in a very deep, coherent manner? Um, um, I can only I can tell you uh, an anecdote from uh, from a high school alumni uh, event here in Washington many years back. The JJ was attempting to figure out how to maybe interact with with, with jazz journalists, with the journalist courses classes, um, day school to figure maybe there's something they could they could add or something to be done. Um, maybe get NEA grants for it. The guy from University of Maryland. Maryland uh, J School, who was an alumni of mine, I didn't know him, I didn't know that at the time I met him, he liked the idea, he said, but, he, but he's lucky that the, that the school is, has a branch in Washington, D.C. that can write and cover politics in the capital. He said that the, the powers that be would have no, have no interest in cultural journalism. They're interested in bureaucracy, making money, the financial side of it. Cultural journalism was not, was not in that. And then, that we've encountered that in other situations too. It's like you're trying to figure out is there someone in any J school or even a music school that wants to have a writing component? And generally, it, it's not what this is not really interesting. And there's, you know, we look at the, the, at the at the landscape for publications. There's some logic to that, but you know, too, you, you don't make that with money being a blogger unless you become very famous. So, my limited knowledge of it is that there's just not there's not a lot of desire, but something that Willard was talking about, about the writing about jazz, I was just going to add that, that it's, I think it's important to encourage because the English language is, is sort of being degraded, cursive writing is, is declining in the schools, but the writing about jazz or writing about other forms of music that, are, that do not have lyrics means you have to make a connection between abstract, something abstract and your senses, your emotions, or something, put that into words and translate to someone to communicate to them. I think that's an important part of your, of your intellectual, your, 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 your mental development. Um, but I think it's just, it doesn't have to be good or bad writing, but the fact that you're responding and processing something that is nonverbal. Anyone else? Uh, uh, for understand, there's some pieces by musicians in the book. Yes, in the anthology section, there are pieces by Herbie Nichols, uh, Wayne Shorter, Archie Shipp, and Dr. Billy Taylor. Okay. Could you talk a little bit more about your decision to include the Herbie Nichols piece in there? Well, you know, I was encouraged in part by my interviews with Robin D. G. Kelly. Uh, some of you may know Robin as the biographer of Thelonious Monk. He wrote an exhaustive biography of Thelonious Monk that uh, just uncovered so much and revealed so much about Thelonious Monk's family and background and that kind of thing. And uh, in the course of, of my interview with Robin for this book, Robin talked about the fact that Herbie Nichols had written extensively about jazz particularly for a publication called Record Changer, among others. And so when I was researching in Downbeat, uh, 
and 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 back issues of downbeat and, and jazz times and uh, other publications, I began to come across some of these earlier uh, jazz publications, and I came across some of the things that Herbie Nichols had written, and uh, I was particularly taken with the piece that he wrote about Thelonious Monk, and Herbie Nichols is one of those underexposed figures in this music. So I felt it was important to not only uh, expose people to Herbie Nichols, but to have his commentary on Thelonious Monk, uh, who many people have a tendency to lump Herbie Nichols and Elmo Hope in that same, same category with Thelonious Monk. There are three very distinctive pianists, but uh, Herbie Nichols was someone I was delighted to come across his writings and, and made sure that we included one of his pieces in the anthology. I appreciate you doing that because I think he is also not spoken of. And also he has actually a lot more music that he wrote that still is being discovered. So it's pretty amazing that he uh, probably wrote about six or seven times as many pieces that were actually recorded. So Absolutely. That's still like coming out slowly to be known about, but it's something I'm, I've been trying to push a lot. and. Hopefully the word will get out slowly. And then, of course, we know we know that uh, Wayne Shorter is is is, is such an intellectual, uh, and so I came across a fascinating piece that he'd written, and the same with Archie Shep, and Dr. Billy Taylor. It goes without saying his importance here in Washington D.C. Uh, and his importance as far as growing that program at the Kennedy Center. And you know, Dr. Billy Taylor, if you, if you encountered him, you know he was a very erudite man. And so having one of his think pieces on jazz in the book was important to me as well. I appreciate that, thank you. And any of you all's uh, journeys of writing, of writing have you ever written anything about like Pharaoh Sanders and uh, Train, like the screams and the sounds that come out of their horn, how that translates into the struggle of what they were saying out of their horn, unlike um, Nina Simone or Les McCann who could do it verbally in their lyrics, but the screams and, the, and, the, and those things that are coming out of their horns uh, were, were directed um, because of the struggle. So I'm just wondering if anybody written anything like that to translate what they're what they think it's saying. Well, A.B. Spellman has a piece in the anthology where he speaks very vividly about a night encountering John Coltrane plus twelve at the village gate, and how to paraphrase what he said, John Coltrane rearranged his sinuses. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he talked about Pharaoh Sanders and, and his contribution because at the point at which he wrote this review of, of Train Plus 12 at the Village Gate, Pharaoh Sanders was somewhat of an unknown quantity. And uh, he kind of suggested that Pharaoh Sanders, he did suggest that Pharaoh Sanders was going to become increasingly important as he indeed did. So that's the one piece that in the book that speaks to what you what you asked about. Uh, I might add to that. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't writing about music at the time. I was at the Associated Press in 1965. And one night, uh, uh, my wife Barbara and I attended a set at the Village Vanguard. Coltrane's group uh, at that time included Pharaoh Sanders and Rashi Ali. And Carlos Ward, right? No, no. Oh, okay. Carlos Ward was not in that group. Alvin Eiler sat in. Wow. Um, wow. Say one more. At one point, they were all screaming on one mic. <laughs> <laughs> he was still known as Leroy Jones was sitting to our right, and he was doing one of these numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and it was quite a night. <laughs> and I'm sure I have, because I tended to try to find a social called the political statement in music. 
people didn't always agree with me, but yeah, I'm sure I have, but that's, you know, it was one of my, I, I, I had Gaddafi and Mao's book in high school, too, so I was very sure. <laughs> Many of the writers in this in this book have have had a tendency to write in that re, in that way, where they look for the socio political aspects of the music beyond the actual performance itself, in terms of those expressions by the artists. So uh, you know, I'm proud to say we've got a number of writers who who who, who have used that, who have examined the music in that way. to um, answer or respond to this um, in such a way that uh, during the time of Baraka and, and Isla and all these cats were really stretching the borders of what sound was, what sound could be, what timing could be, like Ornette with the way he was very uh, elastic with how he interpreted sound, uh, rhythm. Um, what are any of y'all feelings about the way jazz has now progressed to this uh, kind of neat, well-manicured way of playing as a value system? Anybody have any suggestions where some of those aesthetics are just kind of uh, almost uh, frightening to the structures of things? Yes, sir. I'm talking about that. Uh, and we used to have a lot of that, you know. Uh, Luke Stewart, who's from Mississippi as well. Bass player who got his footing in uh, Washington, D.C. is a great bass player who's doing a lot of avant-garde, uh, you know, in that tradition. I think when you look at jazz now is it's almost like looking at the Marvel multiverse. There are so many different traditions that you can go into. Uh, Isaiah Collier, AACM, those musicians are still doing it, still doing it well. Um, Taishan Suri. Taishan Suri, you have Kamasi Washington. Um, you know, you have some people who are doing it in which you can't wait for them to come out with a Mr. Magic album because that's all they've done. Uh, <laughs> Emmanuel, Emmanuel Wilkins is another. Yeah, uh, James Brandon. Um, James Brandon Lewis. Lewis. Yes. Uh, to Howard. Yeah. Um, and you have women who've been in that um, in that tradition as well. So it's still there. Um, I think it may not be uh, written about as the new thing like in the 60s, but people are doing, people are in that tradition and elevating it, stretching it. Um, you got a spoken word artists who are doing it. Uh, I did a piece on, on uh, Moore Mother, who's, you know, she's taking what like Abbott Lincoln and all those people are doing and mixing it in with free jazz and spoken word and the hip hop and electronica. So she's now a member of the Art Ensemble Chicago. Mm -hmm. And Art Ensemble Chicago got a new record out. So, you know, the troops on ground. Well, we had this conversation on Saturday with a bottle of wine, but it, it, <laughs> it, it, the music is out there, but I won't disagree with the fact that the desire to institutionalize, to manicure, it's a funding issue. You get the, you know, uh, and, uh, and once those institutions are set up, and all those music schools and everything, they have to defend themselves against the outsiders. So I think that that, that, that there was a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of verbiage that was spewed that was kind of silly. Um, but uh, hopefully, some some of the people who said that um, will shut up and just play. <laughs> but um, I did I did read something by. Someone who came over and say, "Was it was attacking Ornette again?" It's like, what? Ornette's dead. So why why are you going after Ornette right now? You go to your film scores. But um, but so I think that's that's business. I think in part too. So it's it is um, but there there is a lot. There's it's out there, but it's harder to find. I mean, it's easier to find if you want to stream things and do all that. Um, and you 
could, you know, you could self-release things. And so it, it's like more in love. And more in love was, it was with Roscoe Mitchell with Millennium Stage, a couple, a few years ago. Last, last Millennium, whenever, whenever, in the before times. Um, so I think it's, it's there, but you're right, but it is not, it, it, it is not, um, there's not the same, uh, I think, excitement and there's not the appreciation and anticipation for it because there's this whole other corporate uh, element to it. But it's like old country, you know, kind of like, yeah, there's some good old country, but a lot of it now just sounds the same. Well, thank you all for coming out. Oh, okay, we got a camera here. I, I, I defer to these guys because they, they certainly uh, uh, more current than I am. And uh, I, I, I just don't listen to what's going on so much these days. And they're, they're, they're much more knowledgeable than I. I might be called a boldy fig. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for coming out. And the book is called Ain't But a Few of Us. It's published by Duke University Press. And you need to read it. <laughs> thank you.